And joining us now on the debate in Montreal, Quebec, José Legault, political scientist and national columnist for Voir, a Quebec weekly newspaper. In Kingston, Ontario, Christian Leuprecht, professor of politics at Royal Military College of Canada and Queen's University. And with us here in studio, Richard Gwynn, author of Nation Maker, Sir Johnny MacDonald, His Life, Our Times, and Michael Tobe, columnist with the Ottawa Citizen and former speechwriter for Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And it's good to have everybody both in the studio and in Points Beyond. Richard Gwynn, special shout out to you. I always love it when our senior correspondent makes a return visit to TVO. Thank you very much You've indeed. been coming for so many years. <laughs> Thank and you for inviting me. Always grateful for your presence. I want to start the program by reading this from John Ibbotson of the Globe and Mail. Uh, from earlier this month. He said, on the first anniversary of Stephen Harper's majority government, much attention has focused on tax and spending cuts, the law and order agenda, the Prime Minister's promotion of free trade, and the increasing estrangement of Quebec. But the Conservatives are also bent on transforming the idea of Canada by changing the national myth. Many of this country's most cherished symbols and values, the flag, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, peacekeeping, public health care, multiculturalism, are the product of liberal policies. The Harper government seeks to supplement or even supplant those symbols with new ones, and old ones revived. These new symbols are rooted in a robust, even aggressive nationalism that celebrates the armed forces, the monarchy, sports, the North, and a once overshadowed conservative prime minister, which I presume is a reference to Deef. <laughs> so, right. uh, let's go for the guy first who used to write speeches for... What the heck? Pum sure. <laughs> Pumpsh, as we call him, exactly. Prime Minister Stephen Harper. That's right. Do you think he's trying to change the Canadian identity? Absolutely, and I think he is trying to change it, and I think he's succeeding. But basically, you have to sort of go back a little bit, Steve, to sort of understand how this all came about. I mean, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, way before he was Prime Minister, when he was still a Reform Party MP, when he worked for the National Citizens Coalition, and sort of went in and out of politics, has been sort of experimenting with many different ideas. I mean, there were a lot of dress rehearsals, shall we say, that many people, including myself, were actually included in. You know, lots of interesting ideas, and obviously the occasional idea that would scare certain people. But that's kind of how intellectual discourse works. You try to figure out what does work and what doesn't work. And what happened is by the time he became Prime Minister in 2006, two things were starting to happen. One I've actually written about a little bit for the Ottawa Citizen, a two-part column about what I call Harpertism. Now that's just sort of a play on words of conservatism, mm -hmm. but it basically means Stephen Harper's vision for Canadian conservatism. And what he did was he basically took conservatism, which has been seen by many different eyes and many different people in many different ways, some of it, you know, be it scary, hidden agenda, various other things, and he created a very, very, in my opinion, watered down version of conservatism. But a conservatism that a lot of Canadians would be able to identify with and maybe eventually grow into liking. And that's sort of what's happened from 2006 okay. on. We're going to unpack some of those themes throughout the course of our sure. discussion. Jose, why don't you pick up on that? Do you think the Prime Minister is trying to change Canada's identity? Well, absolutely. And I don't think he's uh, he's ever been shy about it either. Um, and even you know, more than that, I think he's trying to change Canada's political culture. Uh, and uh, not only uh, with these uh, different kind of uh, patriotic symbols, uh, and also trying to upstage the Trudeau uh, heritage, shall we say, uh, uh, with the Charter of Rights, as you said, and basically all the small L liberal stuff, um, but uh, also uh, with a much more uh, defined right wing agenda on a number of issues. Uh, and of course, since for the past years, since he's finally gotten a, a majority government, uh, he's been implementing that uh, in a much more accelerated way. So uh, it's it's identity, but identity uh, to serve uh, this this major shift in uh, political culture as well. Let me pick up on that with you, Christian. Why do you think he's doing it? Well, I think this is sort of the classic agency structure debate and what's actually driving change in our societies. And so I think in the aftermath of the Cold War, there was sort of the sense of that the good guys have won, the bad guys have lost, and we're all going to live sort of in economic, global sort of prosperity all forever onwards. And, and then I think people started to realize that individuals actually matter and individuals can affect change. I mean, uh, and, and when the conservatives get their first majority government after 23 years without one, it shows that individuals do matter and ideas do matter and ideas can make a big difference and that ideas do matter to to voters and so I think the broader question here is though 
is this sort of a, a fallacy of composition that we have here? So is the whole really greater than the sum of the parts? And are we le reading perhaps a little bit too much in between the lines here and trying to make sort of some systematic whole out of things that are really just, you know, the world has changed substantially over the last 20, 30 years. And in many ways, we were preoccupied in the 1980s, 1990s with trying to save the country. And I think so we miss sort of having a discussion about the future because we were stuck in the existential present. And so now finally, Finally, we can have a discussion about the future and I see this more discussion about finally being able as Canada to have a debate about where we want to go as, the, as a country, whether we think we're on the right course and if it's not the right course, what kind of course we actually want to be on as opposed to just having existential debates about saving this country. Richard, let me put that a bit of that list though that John Ibbotson had to you. I mean, you look at the things, the armed forces, the monarchy, the North, which John Diefenbaker first talked mm -hmm. about 60 years ago. Now, uh, none of these is a new idea. So is there anything really new in what Stephen Harper is trying to do? Oh yes, he wants to make uh, conservatism the default political part, uh, government, the default government, as the liberals were for about a century. And every now and then we threw out the liberals because we were tired of them and, and, and so on, but basically they were the government. And he wants the conservatives to be that semi-permanent government. That's one part of the agenda. The other part of the agenda is exactly what's been talked about, and he's, he clearly wants to rebrand Canada as a more conservative society. I would have two quarrels, or not quarrels, but qualifications to make. One is, this is actually, and you touched on it, uh, not so much new as old. Mm. Canada as a society was much more conservative than the United States up until about the 1940s. Before that, if you take the Depression, the, the New Deal by Roosevelt was incomparably more ambitious and daring than our very tame equivalent by Mackenzie King. We were a very cautious, basically conservative society right up to the 1940s, and then we became more liberal than the, than the, uh, than the uh, Americans. The other is that Canada is has been changing anyway from away from liberalism, small L of course, and to conservatism for about two decades now. In other words, he's got the tide running his way. He's not pushing things, he's in fact riding on things to a degree. So, Michael, this was going to happen anyway, regardless of who was in the Prime Minister's office? Well, I think it's actually a bit of a balance of both. And I agree with Richard. Obviously, we were more conservative at one point. But, but the, the word conservative has also changed a lot in the last 70 years. I mean, years ago, I would have been a classical liberal, not a conservative. Mm -hmm, right. And that's how it's sort of modified. But yes, I think that really the, uh, you know, he really is starting to shift it, but not just necessarily independently. It has to be the leader who is a guiding force in some fashion for that to happen. So if you have a weak leader in place, that is not necessarily going to happen. Were Canadians ready for it? Absolutely, and they have to be ready for it. But independently, maybe they were ready for it, but it needed someone to spearhead it. And the success of Stephen Harper over the last six years was that force. But can you get us inside his head, since you know him better <laughs> than anybody here, I guess, and, and that is, you know, Richard's pointed it out, the, the stuff that he's really turned on by is old stuff. Right. It's stuff of a bygone era. Absolutely. What, what animates him about all of that? Yeah, well, I'm not on his Christmas card list anymore, so I don't <laughs> know if I'm necessarily in his head, but I do understand him. I've known him since 1996. Basically, what has always motivated him was a lot of different things, but also American conservatism and British conservatism. He was always very interested in Thatcher, in Reagan, in Helmut Kohl. He was even fascinated by Brian Mulroney, a person who obviously he had a lot of history with, both good and bad. But he's always taken his lead from ideas such as, say, classical liberalism, free market economics, smaller government, more individual rights and freedoms. Inside his head is actually a very bright man and he really truly is a policy wonk. I mean, there's no question about that. But he actually had a lot of ideas that certainly people like myself, for example, had, but couldn't portray them in the best of fashion. And it turns out that this man, who at one time many people were worried about as a public speaker or the figurehead of Canadian conservatism, has become one of its most forceful agents. Hmm. Can I just pick up one Please. thing Michael said? He sure. described Harper as a policy wonk he is. And it's very unusual among Canadian prime ministers to be policy wonks. Yeah. I mean, Trudeau obviously was. Absolutely. Mackenzie King was, except he did very little about it. But, <laughs> uh, you know, those are really the only three 
who would have eat and breathe and, and etc. and drink a policy one, a, a policies, cared about policies, uh, thought about policies. It's just unusual. That's hmm. I just want to point See, that out. See, but I think that's but a little uh, bit too simplistic, perhaps, because what Harper, what we're really having is a debate about the role of the state in Canadian society, the role of the federal government in Canadian society and Canadians' lives, a debate about what constitutes Canadian interests, a debate about how we should assert these national interests. And so I think to boil that down to somebody being a policy wonk, I think there's a much broader debate here. And it's not just Canada that's having this debate, right? We see this debate in across the Western world as, as, as uh, democratic governments are challenged politically, economically, fiscally, and are trying to kind of find their way for the 21st century. And so what the list that Steve provided is really just, I think, a manifestation of these much broader debates, uh, both in Canadian society and global society, about the role of the state and the role of government in our lives. Jose, I know you're but trying to I, get in. I'm Hang on one yes. second. I, I just want to clarify. I don't think Richard was saying that was the beginning, middle, and end of the whole story. It was sort of one, one little angle on it. But Jose, go ahead, uh, follow mm -hmm. up if you would. Well, I, I think just a small proviso here is that, you know, we're talking about uh, Stephen Harper transforming Canada, but, um, you know, Stephen Harper got his majority uh, really from, and this is our electoral system basically, from a minority of electors, I mean, from a minority of voters. Uh, and I know we're going to discuss Quebec a little later on, but let's, let's even start by excluding Quebec from that. And even in the rest of Canada, if you if you take in the voter turnout and the percentage of votes that the Conservatives got, this is not a landslide by far. And so this this is this is very much a, a top to bottom process rather than a bottom to top process. So I, I would caution uh, as to as to as, as to trying to paint this this change as as having occurred already as being uh, as being avant-garde in a way because Monsieur Mr. Harper is an ideologue and it's been quite some time since we've had a, a really uh, um, you know, a, a real, a true ideologue as a prime minister in, uh, in Canada. So he's very determined, but his, his vision is far from being uh, consensual across Canada. Jose, while well, you've got the floor, because you in fact did anticipate exactly where I wanted to go next, it was next on my list, and that is that to the extent that Prime Minister Harper is reshaping Canada's sense of itself or its vision of itself, it, you know, it seems to me like it's an English-Canadian phenomenon. I'm not sure, you know, obviously his government his government's mandate overwhelmingly comes from English Canada. He's got almost no seats at all in Quebec. So how is French Canada reacting to this whole issue that we've been talking about? Well, it's a different planet, basically. Uh, in 2006, when uh, Mr. Harper won his first minority government, uh, he won 10 seats in Quebec. But these were concentrated regionally. And this, again, this wasn't, uh, this was far from being a landslide. This was 10 out of 75 seats. Uh, but nevertheless, he saw this as a, as a potential opening in Quebec so that he could win more seats the next time in order to get closer and closer to the majority he wanted to get. But as Quebecers discovered, as time went on and election campaigns went on, that his vision wasn't the dominant vision, shall we say, uh, which is more centrist in Quebec, not even left of center, but more centrist. Uh, then, of course, they, and there came that absolutely catastrophic uh, uh, election campaign for Mr. Harper, where he came out against, uh, you know, those uh, gala-rich artists and uh, and starting making uh, noises about the Bloc Québécois costing too much money and being illegitimate. Uh, and at that point, something broke. Something broke between Quebec and the Conservatives. It, it wasn't it wasn't a very strong uh, rapport to begin with. But it definitely broke down, and it hasn't recovered since. Mr. Harper understood that very well, so he decided to look elsewhere, and he decided to um, strengthen his electorate outside of Quebec. And as far as as most observ uh, most observers in in Quebec are concerned, uh, this is a divorce. This is a definite divorce between Quebec. Mm -hmm and the um, Conservative the, Party the, of Canada. The Conservative Party of okay, Canada let me follow under up, Stephen Harper. Let me follow up with Michael on this then. Uh, sure. How distressed is the Prime Minister that this reshaping, this re-imaging, rebranding of Canada that he's doing 
is essentially an English-Canadian phenomenon, and Quebec is really not on for this ride at all. Right. Well, I mean, there is some difficulty in that. I mean, one thing José was mentioning is that Harper doesn't obvi didn't have a majority of votes. Well, there have only been two prime ministers in this country who've ever had 50% plurality, and that was Diefenbaker and that was Mulroney. Diefenbaker in 58 and Mulroney in 84. That's it. No liberals even. So, really, unfortunately, that's just kind of the political dynamic and Everyone the electoral system. No, no, exactly. That's, that's what I was explaining. Yeah. It's just that I was I was saying this is a this is a caution we have to take and not say that this is this is overtaking the country by storm and it's no, a, and it's a no, 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 yeah, yeah, but, yeah exactly but, but in terms of Quebec itself I mean obviously Quebec is a little bit of a puzzle I mean you obviously you have to work at it one thing that's interesting is that Stephen Harper and Pierre Trudeau who are very you know diametrically opposed uh, individuals one thing they both sort of had in mind in unison is they wanted Quebec to play a stronger role in, in the Federation now it obviously hasn't been successful in certain ways Trudeau had his issues, and Harper has obviously been only to break through only so much in Quebec. But in the I end, I mean, Harper. Uh, no, well, well, hold on one second. Hang on, <laughs> a, <laughs> hang on a second. Hang on a second, Joseph. You know, Harper, Thank but you. Harper has not given up on Quebec the same way other prime ministers have not given up. He's going to keep working at it and try to field the best candidates that he possibly can and hopefully break through. The problem is now with the NDP and the Bloc, you know, the NDP very, very strong there. The Bloc Québécois is obviously not as strong, but they're still an entity. They still exist and they still will get seen and go up and down, it's going to be a very, very hard road, but Quebec still does play a part of the Tory puzzle. Okay. Uh, I wanted to drag the, the other three quarters of the country <laughs> into the discussion. Uh, the, uh, it is clear to me, for about two decades, you could sense a rising mistrust of government. Canadians have been very trusting government for a long time, and there was a kind of, almost a sort of sagging feeling that you, people were not turning to government to rely upon government to sort out problems and, and help them and so on, that they, they were turning toward themselves much more. And that, I thought, was a, a very major part of what's been happening. That's why I argued earlier that while Harper is very important because he is very determined and he is an ideologue or a policy wonk or whatever you want to call him, he is nevertheless riding a tide. And you can't, in fact, in politics, go against the tide for very long. You've got, to, you've got to have the people behind you. And one of the ways he was adroit in getting the people behind him was convincing people that his conservatism was not raw b blood meat. You know, it was not <laughs> right-wing, crazy exactly. right-wing. And whether that's a phony or not, that was a very important step in, in aligning himself with what I call this shift away from liberalism toward conservatism. Mm -hmm. Christian, d does a politician though, when the country, I mean a country's identity is supposed to be a part of its DNA, <clears throat> can a politician, even the prime minister, change that? Well, I mean, we do live in a federation, and so this is not Thatcher's Britain. Uh, Stephen Harper has limited ability to intervene in the primor in the in basically the, ser the services that are the closest to Canadians, which are municipal and provincial services. They're not federal services. But what Stephen Harper does embody is, I think, sort of a an an, an understanding of a more limited state, and the sort of there's there's considerable limits on what the state should and shouldn't be doing. And in Quebec, the state is a very important tool, and I think francophone Quebecers identify identify with the state as sort of a mechanism for social advancement, for political advancement, for economic advancement. And so I think a majority of Francophone Quebecers have a very different understanding and role of the state. I think there's also debate here about that for Francophone Quebecers, reason and, uh, and reason debate about policy is a very key component of Quebec politics, whereas I think the more sort of ideationally driven politics that we currently have in the federal government, again, sort of clash in terms of what, how, we, how we debate public pol uh, policy. And I think there's a sense of that uh, perhaps Stephen Harper, for at least some Francophone Quebecers, represents a little bit of too much of a throwback to Maurice Duplessis. So this sort of sense of that, uh, that values and ideas and to some extent ideology um, over sort of enlightenment reason of sort of the, 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 the best way sort of uh, forward in terms of rational debate of, of what Francophone Quebecers would understand as a rational debate. And I think they, they to some extent feel also a little bit aggrieved that over the last 15 years they have moved away from the center of national debate and that Stephen Harper has not been willing to let Francophone Quebecers hijack the entire national debate. And so this, this wave and shift towards the NDP isn't as much a support I think for the NDP as it is sort of a strategic vote against what Stephen Harper stands for and the way he conducts politics. 
I wonder though. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Jose, go ahead. And, and, you know, you know, as as a first phase, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and and it's interesting because the components of his uh, of his vision we discussed at the beginning of the show was uh, all these uh, these identity markers that he's shifting, that he's changing profoundly. It happens to be that these particular identity markers are are those that Quebecers reject, <laughs> and uh, whether it's the mo the monarchy. Uh, whether it's the militaristic patriotism uh, that he's sort of uh, that he's sort of unleashed uh, uh, unleashed on Canada, uh, and as well his um, let's let's stay polite his insensitivity his insensi I can't say that in English <laughs> but he's not very sensitive <laughs> thank you very much he's not very sensitive to the issue of bilingualism so we've seen him name uh, high civil servants um, Supreme Court judge. Uh, people who do not speak a word of French. Uh, and that was definitely something that was very discussed in Quebec and only added to the feeling of, uh, of, uh, of rejection in the sense that Quebec rejects, uh, and I'm generalizing, but I'm seeing a strong majority of Quebecers reject that vision. They reject those identity markers and they reject the political culture and the, the, uh, the ideology uh, from which they come. Let me pick up on that rejection notion and talk about it with you, Richard, uh, to start off here. If, and I'm going to oversimplify here for the purposes of our discussion, if Pierre Trudeau represented the view that all the provinces should have the same amount of powers, yes, Quebec is different, but it's not going to have added powers by virtue of being a quote-unquote distinct <coughs> society, and there's a strong central government that we need that can put its nose in provincial jurisdiction when it wants to, to ensure that Canadians have services all across the country. Uh, with some degree of equality. If that was Trudeauvian Canada, Stephen Harper is the exact opposite of all of that. Now, if his view of Canada is in ascension right now, is this country, in effect, turning its back, at least English Canada anyway, on Trudeauvian Canada? Uh, <coughs> I think there's something in what you say. Um, but uh, there is another element which is, I think, very important, which is that Quebec today is not a province like the others. I mean, that is, that is obsolete. Obviously, it is a distinct society. It, it is very close to sovereignty association. It, it acts with extraordinary autonomy, uh, you know, and so on. And English means accept it. I mean, there's no great fuss about it and, and whining and, and complaining about it. There may be an issue on equalization. That's different. That's sort of a, a burr under the saddle. But basically, English means to say, Quebec, we know, is going to go ahead and do whatever it wants to do. And that's the way this world is. Is that acceptance or indifference? Well, both, I guess. Okay. Uh, both is, and, and that is sad, because the indifference is sad, but it's, it's a fact. And, and one fact that has to be recognized. Quebec dominated the national agenda from the 60s to about the, the turn of this century. That's an awful long span. Hmm. And you can only expect people to care about someone on the other side of the river for so long. And that's just human nature. Uh, Michael, if you would, pick up on that question I offered there. Is, does the fact that Stephen Harper is where he is in Canadian politics today mm -hmm. a rejection of Pierre Trudeau's Canada? Yeah, I mean, look, Bob Plemadon, the author, actually just wrote a piece in the Ottawa Citizen recently, and one of his, one of his big motifs was that Stephen Harper is the anti-Trudeau. And I thought that was actually a very good way to look at it, because really you have two very different people. Now, Stephen Harper and many of the other people who are part either of the Conservative Party and many people who voted for him, not all, but most, obviously want to change the country. They want to create, as, as Harper once called it, a conservative Canada. Now, we're not there by any means, but we're certainly slowly moving in that direction. But the way to do it is obviously to move away from the Trudeau model, where it has, you know, a nanny state uh, mentality, where basically we look at ourselves in military issues as being peacekeepers, rather than what we've done in Afghanistan, where, you know, our brave men and women worked very hard, our armed forces were very, you know, very powerful, and they, you know, they defended democracy liberty, freedom, things that a lot of conservatives and I think a lot of liberals actually believe in today. So yes, I think you have to move away from that Trudeauvian model or as Lubar Zink would call it, Trudeaucracy. But <laughs> and if you and if you well I know, but if, if you <laughs> succeed if you succeed on that level I think that you will pr create a Canada, well, certainly the one that they're working on right now in Ottawa, which is more positive, which is stronger, which is more independent, and wants to have a strong position in society rather than always saying, I'm worried about everything else around me. Although, and that's actually good to see. Which government sent our troops into Afghanistan? 
Well, of course, naturally. That's right. Well, the, well it was the liberals. The liberals. You're absolutely liberals. right. Well, sure, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But we kept, you know, but we strongly kept there, and we did support that. Move. So in some respects, Paul Martin was also turning his back Paul, on Trudeau's candidate. Well, too. sure. I, th I think actually a lot of prime ministers recently have. I think even Cretien, to some degree, even though he was one of Trudeau's ministers, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily act in a way that Pierre Trudeau would necessarily understand, especially with Paul Martin as his minister of finance doing, shall we say, fiscally conservative policies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christian, what about it? Are we turning our back uh, more categorically on Pierre Trudeau's Canada? Well, people who've read Pierre Trudeau's political writings will know that he had a vision for this country long before he ever went into politics. And in, by the 1980s, 1990s, I think that's very much sort of what we got. And so we had Trudeau mania, then I think we had Trudeau phobia by the 1980s, and then we had a bit of sort of Trudeau nostalgia. And I think to some extent what Stephen Harper embodies is uh, he, he picks up on that part of Canadian society, and, and, and I mean, this really became a national consensus, I think. And if you lay outside of that consensus, then you were really sort of marginalized in the public debate. And I think what Stephen Harper brings to this is a completely different vision and a different understanding of Canada. And so how I think he set up the politics to some extent is that if you vote, f we are the party that stands for, in many ways, what was wrong with Trudeau's vision for Canada and for the country. And we can talk about peacekeeping and whatnot, but nobody talks about running up the debt, running up taxes, to some extent, sort of the declining standing of sort of our military and our ability to assert our, our interests in the world during that same time. So there is also a counter side to this whole debate. And so I think if Stephen Harper can position himself as that uh, he's about moving forward, where sort of uh, the liberals and the NDP are about the country that was, that I think he figures there's more Canadians who are disenchanted with what was than there are Canadians who continue to support what was. And so in terms of that sort of debate, the Conservatives can likely continue to carve out majorities for themselves if that's the bifurcation between the NDP and, uh, um, and the Conservatives. And of course, with Tom Mulcair now at the leadership of the NDP, to some extent, he does embody the Canada that was and the Canada that was primarily about Quebec. So I think it actually plays into the Prime Minister's hands in terms of painting the opposition as the party that defends what was with Canada rather than how we move ahead and how we move forward into the 21st century. Just parenthetically, well, Christian, well, I notice you've bought into the whole rebranding of the NDP leader. You're calling him Tom Mulcair. I, uh, <laughs> he was, he, he he was, was Thomas, Thomas for the first 60 years of his life, apparently, uh, but exactly. now he's Tom. Right. Can I okay, make Richard, an argument please. of two, two important elements, Pierre Trudeau, that remain very powerful to me in Canada today? One is the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental to this, this country. I mean, it's a definition, it's a political definition of citizenship. 30 and, years ago last month. Yeah, and it, it, that's enormously important today, and it was 30 years ago. The other is that Trudeau, I think, one of his great gifts to us, my, this is my private opinion, not private opinion, but my, my personal. personal opinion, is that um, he gave us the sense that we could be as good as anybody in the world. I mean, Pierre Trudeau, was the most extraordinary prime minister for a country like Canada, you know, a nice, conservative, cautious, blah, 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 country to elect and keep re-elected. And if you can, I can find a direct line between Pierre Trudeau and the own the podium slogan in mm. the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the un as un-Canadian as you could get for us to say we were going to be the first and the best in the world. I mean, you know, the, op the opportunities for total humiliation were right there, and we did it. I mean, it worked, but it was the gutsiness of, of, of doing that. And that mood is around. Canada can one of the changes in Canada is that Canadians are very cocky, very confident today. You know, because our, our, our finances are in good shape and our banks aren't, you know, going belly up and all the rest of it. And also, I would add, because multiculturalism is going so well in this country, you just look in Europe and think, oh, mm. they've made it up, screwed it up. We haven't. We've, we're doing well. So there's a very confident Canada, which curiously has the effect, I think, of making it easier to change. So sure. that's a bit of luck that uh, Harper's got. Jose, s'il vous plaît. Well, you know, it's it's a very interesting because um, this whole uh, this whole battle between Harperism and Trudeauism, basically, that we're witnessing, uh, with Harperism winning for the moment, only because Harper is in power. Because I I don't think we've reached the end of history quite yet. So <laughs> I don't know if we can say you know the liberals are part of the past, the, the liberal vision, and Harper is part of the future. The, the voters will decide that in in the next few years. But it was interesting what happened with Justin Trudeau uh, when he he made that sortie on, on a Quebec radio station where he really lashed out against the Harper government. Just remind everybody uh, what he said. 
by saying, well, he used a metaphor, he sort of, he sort of used a pr provocative image, basically, when he said, uh, if, this is to be, if this is to be the Canada that, that is, uh, then, uh, then I, I could even envisage, you know, you know, leaving it, or some kind of separation. Of course, uh, I'm the one who broke that story on my blog, and, uh, and I explained very well that this didn't mean that Justin Trudeau was turning sovereignist, far from it, <laughs> you know, quite the opposite. But he was, what he was trying to say is, this is not the kind of country uh, that, is, that Canada was supposed to be. And what he was referring to, basically, if we, if we put the, the Quebec question aside for a moment, what he was basically referring to was, um, was the social conservatism that is starting to show under Harper, uh, is anti-intellectual bent, is anti-science bent as well, uh, the militaristic aspect as well. Uh, all of those components of the Harper vision and that are coming out even you know, more strongly since, he's, uh, since he's, uh, he's gotten his majority, that's what Justin Trudeau was lashing out against. Uh, and of course, you know, spins starting and, and, and people in the rest of Canada, especially more conservative leaning commentators and columnists, started accusing Justin Trudeau of feeding, feeding into separatism. But they missed his main point. And mind you, I never thought I'd live long enough to have to explain Justin Trudeau's thought processes. But <laughs> basically, that's what he was saying. And, and to me, and that's what I wrote at the time, is, is that symbolized that clash between the Harper vision, the Harperism, and the Trudeauism, uh, and and especially on human rights and on and on um, and on progressive and a progressive vision, basically, of, of social values against a more conservative uh, vision of social values. So let me pick up on um, one thing you and, said and, there, and Jose. And that's really the I think that's really the clash that we that we witnessed. It had nothing to do. Uh, with sovereignism or, or separation. There's okay. nothing let to me, do with that. Let at me all. pick up on one thing you said there. Michael, I'll go to you on this. Sure. S Stephen Harper gets criticized all the time, as Jose ju just suggested, for leading this so called, you know, socially conservative revolution that's happening across the country. Right. And, you know, in some respects, you know, I'm exaggerating a little here, but not much. You know, when, when Jean Chrétien <laughs> was the liberal leader, or Mike Lignati, or Paul Martin, or Stéphane Zion, he had a, an equally vociferous social conservative base within his caucus as well, but somehow didn't carry the can on that so much. But somehow, when there's one guy on the back benches, and it's more than one, I know, but yes. there's one person in particular right now who's trying to have a bit of a debate about social conservatism as it relates to uh, when life begins, suddenly, you know, here we go, Stephen Harper's hidden agenda again. Is this part of the double standard in Canada? Well, of course it's part of the double standard. I mean, really, this government from... 06 to 12 today has really not been that socially conservative. They have not been really willing to promote social conservative issues. In fact, he's now, spoken no, against it. Yeah, exactly. He's spoken against it. And when Mr. Woodworth actually said he wanted to open the debate about discussing when life begins or the so-called abortion bill, he stood up in Parliament and said, I'm not going to re-enter I'm going to vote against it. I'm it. No, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the reason he did that, you can say maybe it's strategic, maybe it's not strategic, but in the end, he realizes that right now, if conservative conservatism is going to succeed in Canada, it's got to succeed on merits that, they, that people feel comfortable with. Canadians feel comfortable with fiscal conservatism. They feel comfortable about taxes, families, you know, things that really matter directly to them. It doesn't mean that people don't have opinions about abortion and capital punishment and religion. All of them are very important, and I think that in a democratic society, we should be willing to discuss these issues. But they are not the guiding light of this party. They are not the guiding light of this government. And really, it's almost getting tiresome to listen to because, trust me, I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative and a moderate social conservative. I know what social conservatism is. Lots of conservatives do. This is not social conservatism. Well, you, you've got a guy well, working. Beg, hang on one second. Hang on, hang on. Hang on one second. I'm sure you do. I, I, I don't we, doubt we've, it. But. We've got, as far as Stephen Harper's concerned, the evil empire sitting right beside you here in the, uh, representative of the Toronto Daily Star yeah, for yeah. Yeah, well, the, 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 the three decades. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think this is part of Harper's rebranding Canada to bring on a more socially conservative element in our, in our I, new branding? I haven't seen many signs of it. No, I, 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 no he, he stayed away from that. And, exactly. and he's, he's, he's absolutely I right. I disagree. <laughs> well, you may, but I just, let me say Well, I, I could give you an example. Let him, okay, 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 let him make I, make his point I, first. Before you give I like Richard's comments. comments. Let's hear them. No, 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 there's no, he's not, there's none of that. He, at least almost none of that. And he's, been very smart. I mean, because Canadians are not, we, we, 
the same-sex marriage issue was settled in this country with remarkable ease many years ago. Yeah. It hasn't been settled in the United States yet. There's tremendous opposition. We are not like the United States. We are not conservative in that sense. We, there is a conservatism which is on the financial side or the economic side. Right. That's quite different. Okay, Jose. Well, the so, well the social conservatism I think is 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 it goes it's more it's more subtle and it goes deeper than that in a way. Uh, if if you look at the abortion issue, for instance, yes, of course, Mr. Harper comes out on regular uh, on regular occasions saying we won't touch this thing, we won't question it, but he regularly also lets some of his MPs come out and try to do it. When he does that, and we know that Mr. Harper is a very authoritarian leader, so people don't say anything unless they have the permission of the prime minister, basically, in that party. And, and so, because to, to, he wants to give that kind of discourse to consolidate his base. No, he doesn't move on it, but the debate goes on. We also know that the conservative party under Harper is very close to some, some fundamentalist religious groups. We've also seen what he's done uh, against Statistics Canada, basically. This was a very much anti-science bias that he, that he showed when, when, he, uh, when he scrapped, literally, uh, the long census form. And we've seen examples after examples. We've seen it in the last budget. Okay, but how Jose, much cut, how let me much, jump no, in. I just want let to finish that in. point. Yeah, how but much, I know what you're no, going to say. I just want to finish the point. How much he's cut <laughs> subsidies, how much he's cut subsidies to women's groups, to community groups. These are socially conservative choices that he made. Okay, but if you were a smart politician, would you not understand that you needed your base to get reelected and therefore allow a few backbenchers to throw some bones to the base every now and then, knowing at the end of the day it wasn't going to go anywhere? But those are explosive issues. This, this is about women's rights. This is about equality rights. And he keeps letting those people come out in public and question it over and over again. I think that's very disturbing. I think okay. there's but, one thing that did, should be said, though. I mean, and you have to sort of look at also from a strategic point as well. Why would he want his own MP? And he knows that this issue would get a lot of press as well. I mean, it's always nice to say it's authoritarian and he lets it happen. Why can't you believe, and I know it's hard to say this, but that he might have tried to discourage this as well. Maybe he did meet with him and say to him, I really don't want this issue brought up, either because I don't think it's viable or I don't think people are going to like it. Because he stood up and spoke out against it really quickly and so did Gordon O'Connor, the chief whip, so right. they, they made, who made a very yes, strong statement. Well, Christian, hang on, let me hear Christian. Is that's, that possible? That's strategy. Classic good, it's the classic good cop, bad cop strategy, basically. I mean, come on, it, there's so much discipline. I think it's a little more in intricate that party. than that, Jose. So but, much right. discipline in that party. It, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very risky to try to imply that MPs in the Conservative Party just rise up and say whatever they want. Well, let's get a couple of minutes to go here. Christian, break the tie here. Do you think it's, do you think it's possible? that Stephen Harper tried to dissuade this agenda from coming forward, but the reality is uh, he wasn't prepared to expend political currency or capital on it, and therefore it's happening, and c'est là. What? That's well, it. I mean, these are, these are debates, I think, that, profi that matter profoundly to elites and that get played out at the elite level. And we need to distinguish a little bit, I think, oh. between sort of the elite level debates and the mass sort of Canadian debates. And I think to some extent, there's an element of sort of a silent, quiet majority. And that quiet majority, uh, to some extent, it is overrepresented in rural, in rural areas, but it's also overrepresented in some suburban areas and among more recent immigrants. If you look at the way our immigration patterns have changed, recent immigration has been predominantly from countries that tend to hold more conservative, more traditional sort of values. And so I, I don't think, so I think we need to to some extent here take a step back and also see to what extent is this not just sort of somebody imposing his will on the rest of society, but rather also reacting to changing values within Canadian society and breaking up what has been for, for many years sort of an elite consensus around this is the right way to run the country of which sort of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms Arts. is sort of one, uh, one particular manifestation. And of course, in no province is the Charter more popular than in Quebec. And in so Quebec. it's also no Jumping in, I got I 30 seconds left here. The senior correspondent gets it. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say this is a remarkable similarity between Harper and Trudeau, and that is whenever you're discussing I of them, you don't discuss their policies, you discuss the men. You've, all of this, but a lot of this conversation has been about Harper. It hasn't been about conservatism and all the rest of it. It's been about no, Stephen Harper. No, it's about the ideology. No, no, it's, it's not. Ideology. It's about Stephen Harper. 
And he bugs people in the way that Trudeau used to bug them. They haunt us still. Yes, they can. Okay, that's the last word. Uh, José Legault uh, in uh, Montreal, uh, representing Voir, the Quebec Weekly. Thanks so much for being there on the line for us. Merci beaucoup, madame. Christian Leuprecht from RMC and Queen's University on the line from Kingston, Ontario. And here in our studios in Toronto, Richard Gwynn. How many years with the Toronto Star? Uh, a lot. I don't want to tell you. I, I can't even see it. <laughs> Too many can't can. it's, about, um, it's about 45. Fantastic. Wow. And two fantastic mm -hmm. books as well mm -hmm. on Sir Johnny MacDonald and Michael Tove, the Ottawa citizen, former speechwriter to Prime mm -hmm. Minister Harper. No, Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.